Well, welcome viewers. Thank you, John. Um, welcome to the webinar, The Women, Our Impact on the Vietnam, the Anti-Vietnam War Movement. My name is Linda Yar. I'm currently a research affiliate at the Center for Asian Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I'm speaking as a member of the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee. The VPCC, led by John McAuliffe, sponsors events, webinars, and other forms of engagement to highlight and document the role of peace activists in opposing the American war in Vietnam. And also to counter the narratives of the war that the Pentagon chooses to feature. This webinar is one of many that have brought forward the voices of participants in actions and organizations that were critical in mobilizing public opinion against the war. In fact, the movement to stop the war was a broad coalition of groups and segments of society, including professional associations, religious groups, college and high school students, veterans and active duty military. No one faction could represent the whole. Moreover, the anti-Vietnam War movement owed much to the leadership strategy, tactics, and basic values of the civil rights movement that preceded it. I might mention that we are holding this webinar during United Nations Peace Week, a good time for us to reflect on what it really takes to bring about peace. For today's panel, we have invited key women activists to share their distinctive experiences in the movement, to give their assessment of the impact women had on efforts to bring about peace, how they were transformed in the process, and the development of the burgeoning women's movement. Each panelist will initially speak for five minutes, and then I will address some follow-up questions, after which viewers will be invited to submit their questions on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens. I will ask the questions be succinct so that we can address as many as possible. Please keep in mind that this session will be recorded. And once it's posted on YouTube, John will send out a link for wider distribution. These webinars will be archived to be part of the historical record of the era. I should note that VPCC welcomes donations to ensure that these webinars can be made available for viewing in perpetuity. Go to www.vietnampeace, that's one word, .org for more information. Let me briefly introduce our panelists in the order in which they will be speaking. However, I urge you to read their full bios in the program announcement. First, Vivian Rothstein was a civil rights activist who participated as a Mississippi Freedom Summer volunteer in 1965, and in 1967 traveled to Bratislava, Czechoslovakia for a conference that brought together American peace activists and representatives from Vietnam, North Vietnam, and the Provisional Revolutionary Government of South Vietnam, that is, those opposing the US-supported Republic of Vietnam. I encourage you to listen to the audio file of a moving speech by a representative of the Vietnam Women's Union that Vivian recorded and included in this program's resource list. Our second speaker will be Leon Dupacker, who as a Vietnamese student in the United States was called to educate audiences about what was really happening in Vietnam and disabuse them of the way the war was portrayed by the US government. She demonstrated with the group Asians Against the Vietnam War and later had a significant role, which she spoke about in a previous webinar about, that was about research organizations. Uh, her role in conducting research for the National Action Research on the Military Industrial Complex Organization known as NARMIC. No panel about the impact of women on the anti-war movement would be tenable without the participation of Cora Weiss, and we're grateful to have her with us. Cora has received numerous nominations to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, on the basis of her lifelong activism for human rights, 
civil rights, women's equality, and peace. She was a leader of Women's Strike for Peace and the only woman among the four co-chairs of the National Mobilization Against the War held in November 15, 1969. She later founded the Committee of Liaison, Liaison with Prisoners of War that were held in, in Hanoi. Our fourth speaker is Leslie Kagan, whose life as an organizer in peace and justice movements for more than 60 years began when she was a student at New York University, and she led the student wing of the movement against the US war in Vietnam. She was a member of the coordinating committee of the National Student Mobilization Committee against the war in Vietnam, and served on the New York Fifth Avenue Peace Parade Committee. These thumbnail uh, biographies just help to set the stage. Again, please do read the full biographies. So enough of my words, Vivian. Anyway, so enough of my words. Let's turn to Vivian for her remarks. Thank you. Well, first, I'd like to thank Linda and John for pulling us together and for my fellow panelists. I think this is a topic uh, that is very important and very key to building a mass movement in the United States, which we did to, to oppose the war. So I was in 1967, I was 21 years old. I was a community organizer with an SDS community organizing project in Chicago. And together with other projects uh, sponsored by SDS, we were trying to, and other groups, we were trying to build an interracial movement of the poor that could unite with the Southern Civil Rights Movement around economic justice issues. And Tom Hayden was part of SDS, one of the founders, and had been actually tapped by representatives of the Vietnamese to come and visit North Vietnam together with Stoughton Lind and Herbert Apthecker. And in this unique strategy that the Vietnamese had of reaching out to ordinary Americans, ordinary American activists, and educating us and inspiring us and informing us about what our government was actually doing in Vietnam. Uh, most Americans, we really didn't know why our country was at war with Vietnam. There was no clear explanation. There was something about the domino effect and portraying Vietnam as being communist in the North, and non-communists in the South, and the communists were trying to take over South Vietnam as if it were not one country. So uh, Tom was asked after coming back to the US to help put together a conference sponsored by Liberation Magazine that would bring Americans from a wide range of groups, some religious organizations, academic organizations, the press, student organizing, community organizers together to meet in Bratislava, as Linda mentioned, um, and to meet representatives of the, the resistance in South Vietnam and representatives uh, of the resistance in North Vietnam. And um, there were 41 of us that were invited. Um, of those eight were women, which was kind of a sign of the time. And um, at this conference, for we were there for six days. We learned about the history, the proud history of the Vietnamese people fighting for their independence against foreign invaders. And we had a deep dive into the situation in South Vietnam presented by representatives from the resistance in South Vietnam. And um, it was illuminating. None of us knew this history and this deep, rich culture and the Vietnamese women who were there made a point of asking to meet separately with women. A very unusual idea at that time. They said they had something special that we would be interested in and that probably men wouldn't be interested in. And so we gathered and they told us about the brutality of American soldiers, the raping of women to death the parachuting in of women to be used as prostitutes on American basis. And, you know, invasions of villages and the death of children. And, and they said that they felt 
if the American people knew what our government was doing in Vietnam, that the American people would oppose it. And this was their effort to get the truth out. And it was a stunning experience. And that's how I made the, the tape with Mrs. Van. And I played that tape hundreds of times uh, when I got back to the US. So at the near the end of the conference, um, the uh, North Vietnamese asked us to go uh, on a delegation to North Vietnam. And John could show a picture uh, quickly, um, if he has it. Um, they wanted us to see that despite the fact that uh, our government said that there were no military targets being hit, there in fact, it, I mean that there were only military targets, in fact, um, hospitals, schools, villages were being bombed. And we spent our time um, going and visiting these, speaking to people who had been injured by American weapons, particularly cluster bombs, anti-personnel weapons, so that we were informed and inspired and committed to going back to the United States and bringing this truth to the American people. And um, that's what we did. Uh, it was a remarkable uh, beginning of a people's diplomacy that I think um, was one of the characteristics of the building of the movement in the United States. So thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, really brought home uh, what it actually looked like uh, when you when you visited. Uh, Thu, can you uh, speak now, please? Sure, thank you, Linda and John, for organizing this. Um, soon after the Vietnam War ended, the peace movement in Philadelphia gathered to celebrate at the American Friends Service Committee. And we were all asked to say a few words. At that point, as Linda said, I was working for NARMIC. And when my turn came, I thought of the tireless women, selfless, ready to organize, march, leaflet, write letters, make phone calls, go to jail. And I thought of the women in the peace movement who helped me find my voice. Um, the Women of Women's Strike for Peace, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And I thanked them, and I thank them now. I thank you all. Um, the first Women's Strike for Peace member that I met was the mother of my very dear friend um, from the UN school. Her name was Jane Weissman. And her, her husband, Enzi, uh, worked for the UN. So whenever Jane would have Women's Strike for Peace meetings, Enzi would have to be out of the house by UN rules. And so you know, we, we, we remembered that fondly. Um, and, and Jane was, to me, very kind and supportive. <laughs> And I also remember Mai Van, who is another friend of mine from childhood, and who brought me, um, as Linda mentioned, into Asians Against the Vietnam War, you know, and Iqbal Ahmed was, of course, a prominent member of that group. And Thoa, whom you all know, who in a single day could spend an afternoon at a tiger cage with Jane, Joan Baez in Congress, and that evening cook a big meal for, for peace activists, you know. Um, and, and I remember Peggy Duff, I mean, I, you know, I can name so many names, Mary Kochiyama, Kay Camp. But anyway, about myself, um, I like to say that if you dig deep into the life story of any Vietnamese, sooner or later, you will unearth a soap opera. <laughs> and you'll also find that their personal stories are deeply intertwined with the history of their country. And I can illustrate that with my own story. My mother was born in Laos and I was born in Thailand. Her family lived in Vietnam among a large Vietnamese community. And the Vietnamese in Laos were largely sympathetic to the Viet Minh and favored independence from the French. My mom remembered reading books by Rosa Luxemburg and other forbidden literature. Um, and so members of my family joined the Viet Minh my aunt worked for the radio station. My mother learned to use a rifle. And I should note here that our family was part of an earlier Vietnamese diaspora. What do I mean by that? Our family were refugees from the first Indochina war, driven into Thailand when the French bombed Takhek in March, 1946, 
as they tried to retake Indochina. Mm -hmm. My mom and my aunts remembered people saying that the Mekong River around this old trading post in central Laos was red with blood of the people massacred. And for our family, it was a signal to leave Vientiane for Northern Thailand. My mom was 19 years old at the time. Her first job in Thailand was to work on road construction with her male relatives. Later, she became a cloth weaver. Eventually, she made her way to Bangkok where she rejoined her family and managed to find work at eCafe, which stands for Economic Commission for Asia and the Far East. But at that point, I just knew it was eCafe and I thought my mom was a waitress. <laughs> Um, and in 1959, she was encouraged to immigrate to the U.S. She got work at the United Nations and took evening classes at Hunter College. She went on to get her master's in economics at Columbia University, all while working full time at the United Nations. And I was basically raised by a single working mom and her extended family. I didn't know much about my father's life story until much later. And much of that came from friends who were historians of Vietnam. Now, as for my own upbringing, I grew up in Bangkok, went to the international school there. In the mid fifties, I traveled to Sa Saigon to spend time with relatives, including a cousin who taught me Vietnamese history. And, um, the, um, and, and, so, so that was my, my, my growing up. And I lived in New York, you know, during this turbulent period, watching the Buddhist-led demonstrations against Ziem, the immolation of Thich Quang Duc, Ziem's overthrow, the killing of the Ngo brothers, um, the build of American troops in Vietnam, the pacification program and the American bombing. And of course, I felt deeply troubled and frustrated. And I tried to learn as much as I could about the origins of the war. Kane and Lewis's book, The U.S. in Vietnam, was a huge influence. I also read widely other writers like Bernard Fall and Joseph Budinger. Um, and my own mother was disgusted by the Ziem government and believed, as the Pentagon Papers pointed out, that South Vietnam was a creation of the United States, that the U.S. Ha had no business in Vietnam imposing the will on the Vietnamese, and I agree. Um, but I was very frustrated during that period because I, as a as a high school student, I wasn't quite sure what to do. You know, I just joined different demonstrations, and in college, I did the same thing. You know, joined the um, went to Washington for the mobilization. You know, um, and so on. And it wasn't until um, I ended up meeting with a group of American vets uh, against the war going with them to Canada, met Marilyn McNabb, who was working for the American Friends Service Committee at NARMIC, and, 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 and was encouraged by her to join NARMIC. And having joined NARMIC, you know, doing the work that I needed to do to inform people about what was going on in Vietnam, um, that was how I found my voice. But um, my time is up, and I can talk more about that later. Thank you very much, Du. I mean, it's quite a winding road to, to come to your own realization of your own history and to, to be able to, to share later uh, widely with, with the rest of us. Thank you. Um, so now, uh, Cora, um, could you share um, the statements that you would like to make? First, I'd like to say hello to everybody listening and watching. And if I know you, a double hello. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought maybe I should talk about why Women's Strike for Peace was even created. Dagmar Wilson, who was a children's artist, an artist of, for children's books, <clears throat> was married to a British consular official. And she used to have women come to visit her at the kitchen table and one day they started talking about the testing, the atmospheric testing of what we called then atom bombs and the dropping of strontium-90, which is the killer chemical. And the strontium-90 was sprayed around the um, <clears throat> grass 
and the cows ate the grass. And in those days, we gave our babies cow milk. So Barry Commoner, who was a senator, who was a scientist, asked uh, mothers to send their baby teeth after you take care of the tooth fairy to him to see if he could find strontium 90 in baby's teeth. And unfortunately he did and it freaked us out. And we gathered together and persuaded President John F. Kennedy to sign an agreement banning the atmospheric testing of atom bombs, which he did. And he recognized the role that women played we were standing at the gates to the White House when he signed it, and he was asked to look out his window and see us. And he called Jackie, his wife, to send us, to bring us uh, coffee and donuts. We ate donuts in those days as a recognition and appreciation of our role. And very soon thereafter, it was clear to me and a number of others that we couldn't let the war go on without our protesting it and calling for an end and a ceasefire and helping the uh, draft resistors and counseling the draft the draftees who wanted to resist and become conscientious objectors, which we did. But to make matters faster, um, we became a very active force for peace. And especially on July 4, our most patriotic holiday, 1969, we were inv invited by Voice of Women Canada to come to Canada to meet the Vietnamese women. And this is Madam Winyak Zung, speaking mm. with my mother, Dr. Vera Rubin, uh, shortly before that meeting. And she invited me to invite two other women, Madeline Duckles and Ethel Taylor of uh, Women's Strike, to come to Vietnam. We told her we couldn't do it until after November 15, 1969, because as you have heard I was the only woman co-chair of the national mobilization to end the war in Vietnam. So on November 16 or 17, we started packing. And that was my first trip to Vietnam, which led to incredible meetings with the Vietnam Women's Union, because in those days there was a Logan Act which could put you land you in jail forever if you tried to negotiate with the enemy during war. So we didn't want to negotiate with the enemy, uh, whom we didn't. Well, that's an, a longer story. But we negotiate. We not didn't negotiate. We persuaded, and spoke with the women's union, and Win Yak Zung, whose picture I just showed you, was key in all of these discussions. And we brought a unique idea that had never been done before in the history of warfare. The United States was bombing the hell out of Vietnam because, based on the theory that um, the Vietnamese were torturing our prisoners of war. And until that stopped, uh, they would continue bombing. I have one minute left. And so I'll just quickly wind up and tell you that we invented the idea of asking the Vietnamese women if the prisoners of war could write a letter once a month and if we could give them a letter once a month, send it to them from their families. And that worked. They were terrific. And that gave the American government an embarrassing situation where they had to accept from a housewife from the Bronx a list of who was a prisoner of war. And they had to quit that pretext of bombing based on torture 
because we didn't know what was going on. Torture happens in all wars, but we had no way of knowing what was happening. And they had no way of knowing who was alive in the present camp until they started exchanging mail. And the rest is history. Incredible. What a uh, remarkable uh, mm. opportunity to uh, to get behind the, the smoke screen of uh, what was then American policy to see um, uh, what was happening on the ground. Thank you. Uh, Cora, we'll come back to you with more questions for sure. Um, Vivian, uh, Leslie, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> Leslie, um, take it away. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I too want to thank Linda particularly for organizing this panel and for John for all the work over many, many years uh, to keep Vietnam uh, the history of not only the war, but the anti-war movement alive. So thank you both for that. I, I just want to start by just very quickly saying that as we uh, reflect on and talk about the past, uh, I'm assuming that none of us are forgetting that right now, as we talk, our government with our tax dollars is uh, not only protecting and defending, but in fact fueling the uh, Israeli genocidal war against the Palestinian people. We'll talk about that another time, I assume, but let's not forget that. Um, I was one of those uh, milk-drinking babies that Cora referred to, um, and I, uh, I grew up uh, in the shadow of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, I always worried, even as a youngster, that small wars could become regional wars and regional wars could become world wars and world wars could become our worst nuclear nightmare. Um, that was the background that I brought um, into coming of age, my own coming of age in the early mid 60s. I first went to a national anti-war march in April of 1965 when students for a democratic society um, organized the first National March on Washington. Uh, I think there were about 20,000 people there, which felt big at the time. Uh, obviously, we needed to, and we became much bigger over the years. Um, that next fall, I threw myself in into the work at the college I was at, I was at NYU, uh, got very uh, involved with the NYU Committee to End the War in Vietnam. Um, as the war escalated and expanded, um, the anti-war movement in this country grew. We, particularly the young people, that's where I was located, that was my experience, we started to ask questions about why our country was fighting halfway around the world. What was going on? Why were we there? Helping us answer those questions was the teaching movement, which started, I think, also in the spring of 1965 uh, in the University of Michigan. And it spread. This is without the internet, without social media. It spread to campuses all around the country. And we learned at those teachings. Not only did we learn by going to the teachings, we learned by organizing them. What did we want to know more about? Who could help us learn more about everything? Um, so that was part of the background in which we, as young women on many of these campuses, started to think about our particular role. Um, and we realized pretty soon that we, as young women, were doing what women had always done and do always do in social change movements. We did everything. 
um, except <laughs> we didn't give the speeches and we didn't do the press interviews. And just as importantly, we were often kept out of decision making. But all the other work that goes into making a movement, we were there. Um, many men were there too, but we were there carrying more than our share. Um, I just want to mention two of the things that were happening uh, at the same time that were prompting many of us to rethink our role as women in this anti-war movement. First was, and I don't remember the dates at the moment, at a certain point, it looked like the male college um, deferment from the draft was going to be taken away and that men, college age men would be vulnerable to being drafted as young men who were not in college were already being drafted. Uh, at that point, I was already um, the chairman, <laughs> I put quotes around that, but that's what we called it, of the NYU Committee to End the War in Vietnam. And I remember very clearly um, some man getting up and all the other men in the room agreeing that we, the women, should not say anything when we were talking about our struggle um, around the draft. We were shocked and appalled. And so we got up and left the room and met as women. Uh, at the same time that we were experiencing that kind of dynamic, the second wave of feminism, the women's liberation movement, was starting to look more, because of the energy created by that movement, we were all starting to look much more closely at the gender dynamics within our own groups and more generally throughout the movement. This led us, I think, to rethink, to reimagine our role, not only as the doers, but also the thinkers, the planners, the leaders, or part of the thinkers, the doers, the planners, the leaders. Um, we were absorbing the insights of the emerging feminist movement and also absorbing what we were learning from the Vietnamese women. Uh, in a new way that led us to say we are legitimate partners in this movement, right? And we're not going away. And I don't think we've turned turned back that. Um, we haven't turned away from that yet. All these years later, women have still been asserting our place, our rightful place, along with many men in the leadership, in the activism of these social change movements. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Le Leslie, for, you know, that's a very good segue back to, to Vivian. Um, asking you, Vivian, you know, uh, oh, I should, I do need to mention for our viewers, uh, the, cat, the chat function will be open at the time of the discussion. Uh, but when it comes time to actually uh, giving your questions, please use the Q&A function. We're trying to uh, be able to, to keep those a bit separate. But Vivian, I wanted to ask you, you know, given you, their experience with uh, the Vietnamese women, with the Vietnam, Vietnamese Women's Union, uh, what did you learn from them in terms of organizing? And how do you think, um, you know, it may have led to what uh, Leslie said of the influence on uh, the burgeoning women's movement in the U.S. at that time. Well, I'd say there were two major messages I got from my experience meeting with uh, the Vietnamese Women's Union members. Uh, one was that women are uniquely skilled and able to organize, not just women, but women, but also everyone, that uh, when it comes to a war, when it comes to the uh, communication of the suffering, the human suffering that this war created, not just for Vietnamese, mostly for Viet Vietnamese, but also for American families whose sons were uh, drafted into the war, that we we had the skills, we had the ability to, to inspire people to, to act, and we had the responsibility. That's what I took away from that. Mm -hmm. Just enormous feeling of responsibility for 
the, you know, towards the people that I met in Vietnam. And, and so no one had ever said women have skills at organizing or, or persuasion, you know, it's, it had always been men. And uh, I had never spoken publicly uh, before I had <laughs> come back from Vietnam. And then I was doing public presentations everywhere to any kind of group. Uh, it fe I felt like I had the mandate to do that. I must do that on behalf of my Vietnamese friends. Um, so that was one. Um, the second was that the Vietnamese women, they built this organization that was multifunctional. They met the needs, the women's union worked to meet the needs, the day-to-day -day needs of women through um, food co-ops and childcare co-ops. And they, they tried to train, offer training opportunities they also trained women for leadership in the political environment at the village, provincial, and national levels. And so they had an organization that was multi-level. And uh, I was very inspired and eventually helped to start the Chicago Women's Liberation Union, which did the same, was based on that model. Meet people's immediate needs, train people for leadership, engage in the political process and the policy process. and. Um, so it was very influential in Chicago because it was a very successful effort and the beginnings of independent women's liberation organizations. Hmm. Fascinating. It seems, too, that, you know, one takeaway that I always found from um, working, um, understanding the way the Vietnamese uh, approached the war was their insistence that they can reach out to the American population, to the citizens, and uh, not blame them for the, the policies of the government, which, which uh, is essentially what, what you experienced. Right. So, Du, um, you had, uh, how, how would you say your experience in uh, organizing around uh, stopping the Vietnam War impacted you and your own future? Did you also find any uh, particular challenges for being Vietnamese in this movement? Well, um, I guess I had I had talked a little bit about that among some of you privately, um, that some people in the peace movement, you know, like to think that, you know, I just walked out of the jungle when yeah. I did not, as you can see from my description of my, my, my history. Um, but but I think that and 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 sometimes I was asked to represent um, parties that I didn't represent, but I realized that the people who asked me to do that were very well meaning, you know, and and so it's and and I think that I got over that and and I think that what what I learned is that as I was able to communicate more with Americans and let them know about what really the whole history of the war, you know, um, in, including the, the 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 violation of the 1954 agreement, which a lot of people never knew about, um, the 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 imposition of you know um, regimes, you know, in the South, the Ziem regime and their successors. Uh, as I was able to explain that to people. Um, I felt more empowered, you know, I felt like I had, I had a voice and that I could speak. Um, I mean, that there was a very important for people to know the history, not just sort of see and, and know that their, 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 their government, you know, um, well, let me say this. A lot of Americans, when I started to talk to them, including naval officers in, um, in Rhode Island, uh, did not know that the Viet, that Ho Chi Minh um, was and the OSS worked together. The OSS meaning the Office of Strategic Services, um, you know, who who was the precursor of the CIA. And 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 that and if you listen to um, Archimedes Patty, who was assigned to work with Ho Chi Minh at the time, you know. He he said very clearly that the it was the Americans who 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 was made a mistake. They had promised Ho Chi Minh that they would support Vietnam's fight for independence, but instead they 
because of uh, because of the dict what the French wanted, which is that they made American support for the French conditional on French joining NATO. Um, that was how the Americans, you know, moved away, as as Archimedes said, into betraying Ho Chi Minh, and 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 then under McCarthyism and all the anti-communism and so on, the U.S. then tr got trapped into uh, into a war um, that it n had no understanding of, and and I think that this was where the Vietnamese, you know, we Vietnamese, I think, played a role is is to let people know. That that we had a long history of being opposed to foreign domination, from the Chinese to the French, you know, over a thousand years, you know, and the Americans were not aware of any of that history, and with very tragic consequences for all parties. <laughs> all too all too true. I want to turn now to to Cara. Cara, you know. Um, with all this experience uh, of your, your anti-war work during the war, and then later on, uh, you were one of the movers behind uh, the passage of UN Security uh, Council Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security, which uh, calls for women being at the table when, um, so to speak, when, uh, the, the, uh, serious questions of peace and security arise. Why should that be? How did you how did you manage to um, make this argument? I love the question because I'm most proud of that experience. It's one of the best things I think I've done. Thirteen twenty five has three P's for peace participation of women at all levels of governance, protection of women and girls during armed conflict, and prevention of armed conflict. And that's probably the most important because prevention was a toxic word at the UN in early days, even though the charter was created to end wars. Mm -hmm. So uh, 1325 was unanimously adopted by the Security Council in the year 2000, and it's now implemented in a hundred and, I just got the number this morning, 110 countries um, around the world which have national action plans, meaning plans to part, to implement what the 1325 calls for. It's important because women are more than half the population in the whole world, and we are the victims, and we are the sufferers, and we don't get a chance to say no at the table or yes, depending on what we're looking at. So we have to be equal because if you're for democracy and justice, you have to be for equality. It just comes together. And if we're equal, we have a right to talk and to listen and to participate at every level of governance, not just at a peacemaking table. Unfortunately, the resolution, which was unanimous, is not mandated. It doesn't say you must or you should or you shall. But 110 countries have now turned it into law, and it is international law. Uh, it's important because we can't let men and the corporate world of men, weapons makers, drag us into wars, which is what's going on in the world. Wars don't bring democracy and they don't bring peace. Mm -hmm. We've got to get to peacemaking and there is a national uh, 
Global Network of Women Peacemakers, which I recommend to everyone, GNWP. Um, we've got to get peace education into schools so it becomes a common understanding of how you make peace and what the definition of peace is and how to continue peacemaking. Peace education is critical. It's important. We have to get women at the seat peacemaking tables, which are the ceasefire tables of today. And you, you, I used to say, no women, no peace. Now I say, no good women, no peace, because we have found ourselves surrounded by some pretty horrible women, as we have been surrounded by some pretty horrible men. It's a very critical year for our election and for women around the world. I don't know what else to say except that 1325, you should look it up in the, under the United Nations.org and uh, see what we did. It, it's totally driven by civil society. And every October, we celebrate it and bring young people in to become peacemakers. So it's uh, had a good life. And it's a terrific resolution. And I, Kofi Annan sent his wonderful woman. Oh, no, I'm going to forget a name. Somebody King from Jamaica to uh, watch the resolution develop and to support it and to bring him the information. And he and his wife, Nan, were huge supporters <clears throat> of women, peace and security, and of women participating in governance. I think that's um, you know really a, a key legacy, um, not only of of your personal work, but of this evolution that we we're talking about today of women getting mm -hmm. energized uh, against uh, first of all against uh, the nuclear bomb. And then, you know, into um, uh, anti-war movement. Leslie, you know, given that you're, so much of your, your work, you know, started um, in the student movement in particular, um, are there lessons from those years, the anti-war movement among, as, it was, as it played out among student groups that might be useful um, for organizing in current wars? Um, yes, I think there are some lessons. Having said that, the world is a different place than it was in the 1960s. Yes. Uh, so lessons are not, um, if you just do it like we did it, everything will work out for you. It's not that kind of lesson. <laughs> uh, it doesn't work that way. Um, I think for me, and I think for many young women, you know, people who were young at that time, um, what we learned is that we need to not be shy about our insights and our questions. Asking questions is critically important. Not only asking questions of policymakers and the institutions that control so many aspects of our lives, but asking questions within our own movements, within our peer groups. Um, we need to not be afraid to push each other, um, but to do that in a loving way. <laughs> um, there's a, a, a difference between being um, you know, probing and pushing each other is a very different thing than beating up on each other. Um, and that doesn't get us anywhere, the beating up on each other. But um, as women so much, and I think this is still true today, and I know, I know it's true today, that for all of the advances that the women's movement has made, um, there is still structural sexism and misogyny is running wild in this culture today. Um, and I'm, uh, I, I'm worried that young girls, young women, 
don't uh, don't often have the supports that they need to be them full their full selves. And as actors in um, in the anti-war movement, we grew into being our full selves. Right? It was not just that, that we went into that movement feeling like we knew the answers, we knew how to end this war. We knew the war had to end. And we knew that meant that the U.S. had to get out of Vietnam. But we didn't have the answers for how to actually make that happen. What, but nonetheless, we felt strong enough because we had each other, right? We had the support we were getting, getting from our friends and co-workers and allies and uh, our buddies um, to keep pushing to say, to, to raise the questions. Um, and in the course of that, not just raising the policy questions, but the questions about our own dynamics within our movements. We need to pay attention to what goes on uh, in within our movements. I just want to add one sort of footnote to this too. Um, there was something I, I referenced before, the the work that, that unfolded on a lot of campuses around the draft when the young men were, um, first there was a threat of them losing the deferment and then it finally did happen. Uh, there was a slogan that got pretty popular, women say yes to men who say no. Some mm -hmm. I remember that. Well, just as a little footnote to history, not all women were saying yes to men just because they said no. We still encourage them to say no, but we weren't we weren't gonna be saying yes to them regardless. <laughs> so just to be clear about that, that sometimes gender dynamics um interfered. With the, with a an ability to be as clear as we needed to be about the big policy issues, right? That the the war was wrong, whether and 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 men saying no to the draft, whether they were in college or not in college, was right, right? Whether or not women would sleep with them, <laughs> and let's not use gender assumed gender roles. Um, as a tool in 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 fighting in this instance against a war, right? Let's make let's make space for um, all of these struggles to be unfolding at the same time, and and not twist and and manipulate, if you will, um, some assumptions about gender roles that are that are really not called for anymore. So that, can I follow up on for just one second on this? First, somebody just posted that somebody named King was at the UN. Coretta Scott King was not at the UN. The UN only has Security Council, only has ambassadors of countries. Jamaica had a woman ambassador, and uh, the US had one too. Uh, anyway, I'd like to just point out that. Inventing new things is critical to creative energy. And we invented the idea of the Committee of Liaison, for example, to have an exchange of mail. We did things creatively that were new. And we used to have uh, slogans that we put on our bosoms or our chests all women are sisters. Hmm. So, and we put them on the bodies of Vietnamese women as well as American women. So inventing and being creative is very critical to the culture of the moment. Who knows what's gonna work tomorrow? Hmm. Very true. And I think, um, you know, th with the uh, these slogans such as, uh, the idea of girls say yes to boys who say no. I mean, that also plays into a kind of uh, looking back at the movement that's that's uh, perpetrated in some circles as, well, you know, these college students, it was all about drug, sex, and rock and roll. Um, and, you know, I think as is very clear from uh, the, partic the participants, 
there was also at that time a certain idealism that we were that many uh, people were questioning why our country wasn't um, wasn't living up to its purported ideals. Um, well, I think we can open um, the the webinar to uh, questions. I'm going to read a few that have come in so far. Uh, one is by Catherine Podol Podolgian. Uh, she says, we've all read numerous opinions on both sides of the question of whether or not the anti-war movement contributed at all to ending the war and thus saving lives. Or did we simply cause the government to dig in its heels and the ending was in fact caused by powerful people who said the cost was too much and therefore shut it down. I'm not ignoring, of course, the massive struggle of the Vietnamese people who won their war and would have done so even without us. Uh, would anyone like to answer that? Oh, lots, <laughs> okay. Vivian? Well, if uh, I would recommend uh viewing the madman and the movement, the movement and the madman. Right. Uh, because uh, the it shows that really Nixon and Kissinger would, would have dropped nuclear bombs on North Vietnam if it weren't for the massive mobilization that, uh, and, and the mobilizations around the country. I think uh, there was a feeling that the, the country was gonna be ungovernable and it was getting ungovernable. And, and the people, the ordinary Americans just would not tolerate an escalation of the war. And I, I think, I, you know, you can feel it. You could feel it during the movement, how the, the anti-war sentiment was just spreading. And one of the messages that I learned from this movement is go broad, you know, unite around your major goal. Don't demand agreement on every single issue. If you really want to win, and make it policy change, you have to embrace a very broad range of, of Americans. And, and, I, uh, and I think we did. And I think it is an untold uh, success. I feel that's one of the reasons uh, John's work is so important. I think the power of the, the broad-based women, you know, um, anti-war movement around Vietnam was quite remarkable and oh, impactful. Oh, sorry. Cora, and then Leslie. I just want to point out, thank you for mentioning the movement and the madman, because Kissinger did say to Ray, to uh, Nixon, we can't drop an atom bomb on Vietnam because we don't have American uh, public opinion support with us. And that was the result of the mobilization and the moratorium, the October and November 15 demonstrations which were mammoth, millions of people. But I also want to point out that the Jeanette Rankin Brigade, which was an yes. invention by women, right. had a slogan, end the war in Vietnam and racism and poverty at home. Mm -hmm. And we had women of faith leaders, we had women of color, we had all kinds of women gathering together under those slogans. And it was hugely, hugely impressive. Jeanette Rankin was the first woman member of Congress. She unfortunately voted no to joining World War One and Two. Well, two. But she was a pacifist. And there's a statue to her in Statuary Hall in the Congress. It was a great event, a great group. Leslie? Yeah, um, I just want to add one thing, um, and that is, uh, and it's often not recognized, that the, the work we were doing in this country, I don't know what all that background noise is, but... Yeah, some, someone, uh, in this, yourself. <laughs> huh? I... I'm asking, oh, it, it seems to be gone now. Okay, go ahead. Okay. The work that we were doing and the, the growth and the strength of the anti-war movement had, had an, an impact globally, right? We were sending a message to people all around the world, and particularly to the people, not only Vietnam, but Southeast Asia, 
that not everybody in this country <laughs> supported what our government and our tax dollars are being used for. And that's a very important dynamic that has been repeated many times in, a, in our history where what we're doing in this country to oppose our government's policy helps strengthen the resolve of people in all parts of the world, uh, often on the receiving end of that bad policy. Absolutely. So uh, here's another question maybe for Du. Um, how can we use the women, peace, and security agenda to change the current institutional culture with the military industrial complex? <laughs> Since you studied the military industrial complex uh, in relation to the war in Vietnam. Have you any uh, comment for this question? <laughs> Sorry, this is a very difficult question. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm at a loss to answer that. It certainly is deeply embedded in, uh, in our culture and politics. Anyone else have, a, have some insight? Um, well, yeah, I would say uh, more women in Congress is, uh, and, and, you know, and a woman in the White House might have some impact on changing the culture uh, within the military and the military industrial complex. But Can I, you accept I, saying a progressive woman in the White House and progressive yeah, women sure. in Congress? Yeah, sure. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they someone with consciousness. Yeah, about about women's position, you know, worldwide women's positions, and um, but uh, that was certainly we didn't go that broad in the anti-war movement. <laughs> it was really just to end the war in Vietnam. Uh, but that's uh, that. Your question raises a big issue, and I just want to uh, acknowledge Nancy Hollander, who um, is on this call, and she actually went to the very first connection in a, a meeting in Jakarta between American women and the, the Vietnamese, the very first one in the beginnings of this people to people democracy, uh, people to people di diplomacy that the Vietnamese um, developed and was so powerful. We have Nancy on if we can unmute her. Can I just there. add one quick thing on this yeah, topic? Sure. I think that the, the, the our culture is inundated with militarism. Now, our day-to-day -day lives are inundated with militarism, and we have got to challenge it not only on the international level, but in our own communities, right? In in um, in every aspect of our lives, um, it's a massive task, but we have to do it, um, and we have to find ways. And sometimes it's those little openings that lead to bigger openings and bigger openings. Nancy, Nancy? do you want to? talk about the 65 meeting? Sure, <clears throat> assuming you guys can hear me, I maybe I yes. can actually, um, I don't know if I can get my, my picture up, but um, <clears throat> it, this was the first one and for some reason it gets whitewashed away. The first one was 1965, not after Tom came back not in 1969 or 1970, it was 1965. Madame Ben mentions it in her first book and is going to mention more about it in her second book because they now have all my artifacts that I gave to the museum in uh, it's either 2018 or 19. Uh, they have all my notes now from that meeting. I went around the country in 65 and 66 speaking about it and brought back the first film uh, that ultimately went to newsreel. The very first film, I, I brought it back on my body with my coat over it. Uh, there were three of us who brought them back. The other two got stopped and I didn't coming through immigration in the US. And that was the first, first film of US planes um, over Hanoi and around other parts of North Vietnam. So. Um, it just distresses me that we always forget about this. It was organized by Women's Strike for Peace. Mary Clark was kind of our leader, although we didn't really have a leader. And um, okay. 
it, it was a, a wonderful meeting, but I just don't want it forgotten. That's all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Much, um, I have a, a message from Barbara Winslow, who would like to um, speak about the experience in Seattle. John, can you? Yeah, it'll, Barbara, take, a, you there? it'll take a minute. So why don't you go on to something else? Okay. Um, so uh, Valerie Branas asks, is anyone organizing to push the U.S. to abide by the rulings of the International Court of Justice regarding Gaza and so forth? Does anyone know about that? I'm sorry, say that again? The question is, uh, is anyone organizing to push the U.S. to abide by the rulings of the International Court of Justice with respect to Gaza and so forth? You know, during the Vietnam War, the lawyers were very well organized and would have done that today. But there's no lawyers committee today that I'm aware of mm -hmm. on Gaza, Israel. Uh, and unless you're a member of the international court, you don't have to abide by it. And we're not. <laughs> yeah. Bar I mean, Barbara I, should be. I'm ready. Go Am ahead. I unmuted now? Hi, yeah. everybody, and especially to Leslie. It's great to see you. And I just want to mention in Seattle, NC Koppel was uh, a founding member of um, Seattle Women Act for Peace and very beloved. And I wrote a book about the Seattle Women's Liberation Movement, which I understand is being uh, listed as a resource. And I talk about the impact of the women's liberation movement on the anti-war and anti-imperialist movement. And I think it's really important to look at the local history because it can dispel a lot of the myths that we're dealing with. People were talking about the slogan, girls say yes to boys who say no. I think it was more than a slogan. And our draft resistance group, which had a number of very committed left feminists in it, we challenged that. And we were successful. And uh, draft resistance had a picnic. They invited me to speak about women's liberation we didn't get booed. We didn't get heckled. We didn't. So I think the presence of women of women's liberation or left feminist activists in the anti-war movement was really important. And Seattle it was the home to the McCord Air Force Base and the uh, uh, McCord Air Force Base and the Fort Lewis Army Base. And Seattle was the second largest embarkation point to Vietnam. We leafleted the airport. We worked in the GI Coffee House, which was called the Shelter Half. Uh, a woman from Radical Women and myself, and we talked to GIs about organizing. Uh, Jane Fonda brought her FTA show to Tacoma, and 200 GIs in uniform showed up. I mean, there were thousands there. And the FTA show let us speak about women's liberation along with uh, Jane Fonda's speech. So uh, I think we played a very important role. We disagreed with the Joan Baez position. We read and we wrote and we articulated and tried to bring a gendered analysis into the anti-war movement and understandings about war, peace, imperialism, and so forth. We wrote articles in local newspapers. We spoke in the local uh, radio stations. We demanded and won the right of women to speak and bring a feminist analysis to the anti-war things. I'm gonna talk quickly because this is really, uh, I think, very important. We participated in the Voice of Women meeting, a women's liberation activists uh, from Washington State uh, at British Columbia. And then the next year, a bunch of us uh, met informally with women of Vietnam. And I took a picture, there were a series of pictures of me with the women from Vietnam. And later when I went to Vietnam in 1996, uh, I met with a woman named Van An who had been active in the National Liberation Front. And I gave her one of the pictures for the museum in Hanoi, the Women's Museum in Hanoi. And at that point, there were only two pictures of women, Angela Davis and Jane Fonda. I don't know if that picture is still up, but it's, uh, it's a wonderful artifact. And a copy of that photograph is now in the archives um, at the University of Washington. And I just want to add in the light of what's going on today, women's liberation activists, at least in Seattle, and I document this in my book and in the chapter, we opposed 
we oppose colonialism and imperialism from Algeria uh, to uh, Zimbabwe. And you can look at the literature. We were supportive of the Palestinian uh, struggle, the Palestinian rights. We were in opposition to Zionism. And I will bet, because I've interviewed a lot of the women, they still are. And I think if we look at a lot of the encampments and a lot of the members of um, Jewish Voices for Peace and Students for Justice for Palestine, I know this from Brooklyn College, um, we can see the role that women are playing in these movements. And I think one of the great things that happened to us, our generation, you know, and I don't disagree with anything any of you said, it's just been wonderful, is I think we began to decenter white Western women from discussions about uh, feminism, feminist activism, and we began to bring in gendered and uh, analysis of gender and race into uh, these struggles. Um, and I think this new generation of activists, the white women listen more uh, and accept the leadership of women of color, which I think we were not as good as we should have been. But anyway, that's my quick thing. And reading by the book, <laughs> Ansi's in it, by the way. I interviewed her. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara. Um, here's a, a question from uh, Mary Byrne McDonald, uh, which I think is probably the, a, a question for, for all of us. Can you say something about what is distinctive about women's contributions? Is there something only women can do? I am struck by the knowledge and clear-headed analysis of the stakes that you've demonstrated. Is there something that women bring to the to the movement that would not have been there otherwise? Leslie? And then yeah, I, I, I mean, I think there's uh, probably a lot to say on this, but one thing I would say is that we bring to this, to this, to anti-war work generally, not only to the anti-Vietnam war, but all the wars we've been fighting against since then, uh, and a whole host of other movements too, we bring a more complicated analysis of what, what is going on. What is the power that we are up against? What are the dynamics at play? And I, building off of what Barbara just said too, I think that, that once that door gets opened, once you start making drawing out the complexities of these situations, of these power dynamics by adding gender, it makes it a little bit easier to think about race, right, mm -hmm. and class, and a whole host of other very important dynamics that are all at play at the same time. Right. And I think we need the depth of that complex analysis to actually challenge power. Right to actually get win the kind of victories that that make it possible not just to end a war but to stop wars. Mm -hmm. right? It's enough with the band aids, you know what I mean. There are some structural changes that need to be made, um, and to do that, we need that complexity uh, of understanding. And I think women bring a key element to that and help make it possible to bring in other elements. Vivian. Yeah, I'd say uh, women also do not default to violence. Violence is not generally a solution for women, uh, physiologically, psychologically. Um, and uh, I. so I think, at, so that's one point that it's not like the first impulse. Mm -hmm. And even, you know, amongst men, it can be that that's how we solve something. That's how we build a movement. Uh, we commit acts of, of violence. Generally, women don't, you know, move in that direction. So I don't think we see violence as a solution for any social problem. Um, the other thing is I think women um, collaborate. This is a generalization, but women's collaboration and ability to share power, it's not always, you know, perfect. But I think there's more of a tendency of women to be able to engage in groups without being the top dog. And that allows a lot of people to move into a movement and uh, play a role and get their feeling of, of self, you know, self-respect. 
Uh, and so it's not like following the, the great leader. I think women uh, have less of a impulse to either try to be the great leader uh, and they more want to bring in a, a more collaborative uh, environment. Um, and, and I'd say, you know, there you had one question of how the, the anti-war movement, you know, benefited the growth of the women's movement. Mm -hmm. And Leslie was talking about this. Women organized everything in, in the anti-war movement, every teaching, every demonstration, you know, letter writing campaigns, everything. Yet they were not running the organization and we were ready to run our own organizations. You mm -hmm. know, enough of this. We had the skills. We had, we wanted to go broad and let's, you know, let's run it ourselves. So I think this skill building was extremely important and the bravery that, mm -hmm. that people, you know, had to go up against the American government and the uh, military. Mm -hmm. It was not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, so there's another question, uh, primarily for Cora. How much interaction do the Committee of Liaison um, have with President Nixon? Did you sense anger or embarrassment from his administration? I don't think that's the question. I think the question is about the National League of Families, not President Nixon, although he was very supportive of them. No, there, so there's a we had interaction with all of the families whose mail we delivered immediately mm -hmm. when it arrived uh, by hand. And we had interaction with the whatever the press would give us. We uh, didn't, we understand how the families felt, not knowing if their loved ones were dead or alive, not knowing if they were prisoners of war or missing in action because there was none of that given out by the government. They could only find out if they got mail. Mm -hmm. And then when they had a letter, they knew their guy was alive, their son or their brother or their cousin or their uncle or whatever, husband. And we played that role. And somebody in the press said that we cared more about the prisoners of war than our government did. And I, really am humbled by that. But I think it's true because we negotiated with the women's union to increase the packages that they could receive, the frequency and the amount of things they could get from here, from home. And the government didn't do that. So there we are. They didn't like us because we didn't support the war. They couldn't hate us because we were taking care of their loved ones. Mm -hmm. The um, so you know, I'm wondering uh, for two. Um, have you? How do you uh, find? Um, how should I, what is? What would you say is the the status of? Um, reconciliation among Vietnamese Americans in the United States at this point, given the history of the war. Can you um, speak to that? You're muted. <laughs> You're muted. Uh, I Thank think you. that the, the current generation Thinks a little bit differently from you know their parents, for whom I mean a lot of a lot of the Vietnamese who came here were allied with the Saigon side and were very bitter about you know how things ended, and I think that their children and and grandchildren and and people like Viet Thanh Nguyen um, look at things you know differently, and I think that have helped them. Um, understand better uh what is going on so i think that that's i think so there's i think that there is more reconciliation also more vietnamese here um mm -hmm. vietnamese americans are going back to vietnam and 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 so so there's reconciliation at that level and and to the conversation about complexity i think that 
we're we're all understanding that you know things are not black and white, including in Vietnam. Um, I mean, I think that 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 we were right to want the U.S. out of Vietnam, but um, but I have to say, after the war ended, I mean, I I I did come return to Vietnam again from 1990 on to uh, to work um, in Vietnam as an economist, you know, to work uh, with the Vietnamese government, and uh, and and it was very was very meaningful for me. But but we 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 found that it was a complicated it was a complex situation there, and and in terms of you know thinking about it is it all for naught in a sense, I, I remember arriving in Hanoi around two thousand and two, um, and 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 going into the 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 city from you know from the airport into into Hanoi, looking at all these um, big signs of multinational corporations mm -hmm. um you know lining this lining the streets and i said if i was rip van winkle and went to sleep in 1960s and 1968 and went to vietnam in 2002 i would have thought that the americans had won the war mm -hmm. uh but it's still i mean having said that it's still complicated because mm -hmm. You know how things have played out in Vietnam. Um, it is is of the Vietnamese choosing, and in a sense, when when I say that, it also means that all all the bombing, all the all the lives dead, and so on. You know, didn't change very much. I mean, when you compare the Geneva Agreement in 1954 that I mentioned with mm -hmm. the 1973 Paris Peace Agreement not much change from there, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and and Ho Chi Minh did want, I mean, Ho Chi Minh even asked to be, have a relationship with the U.S. like the Philippines did, you know, after World War II. I mean, so, so what was that all about? And I think that that's what, I, I don't think we have communicated well enough to, um, to people, you know, that, that it was all for naught. I mean, you know, all all that tragedy. And and, and to, to now when we're talking about Gaza, you know, um, again, uh, to what end, you know? Can I point something out, just a fact? Sure. We have favored nation sta trading status with Vietnam today. Vietnam signed the 1325 UN Resolution on Women, Peace, and Security. Vietnam is not a war. It's a country, and it's functioning. And kid teenagers love taking bike trips to Vietnam because it's a beautiful place and great for bike riding. So mm -hmm. let's deal with Vietnam today, which, you know, we... We have Agent Orange affecting our veterans and families the way they do. So we've got a lot in common and not much in conflict anymore. I agree. And I, and I think this is a, a perfect uh, note to, to think about for all of us. How do we move forward? with uh, a, a, a relationship with Vietnam that is multi-tiered, not just commercial, not just um, military or security oriented, but multi-layered in terms of people-to-people -people exchanges, students coming back and forth, uh, joint research projects, all of that is what um, we need to look forward to, in my opinion. Um, well, I think we've, we're uh, coming to the close of this uh, remarkable session. And I hope uh, the viewers will join me in thanking our panelists for their heartfelt presentations and uh, thank John McAuliffe and the Vietnam Peace Commemoration Committee for making these webinars possible. We do encourage you to share the link 
that will be posted later once it once it's posted on YouTube and to uh, share this this recording widely. Uh, these are uh, issues that we've covered that are distinctive and capture a, a, a critical moments in our nation's history. And I think, I hope that it will have uh, oh. some oh. word, uh, opportunity to, to get people thinking. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Linda. Um, Linda, I need you to stay on when everybody else goes off. Um, so thank you very much to the audience is now saying goodbye. We see them closing down. And uh, I think this was an excellent, excellent program. Um, Cora, there was one question, a personal question, whether we can assume that Dr. Vera Rubin was the legendary world-renowned astronomer. Is no, that, no. She was a world uh, renowned. She was a world known anthropologist. Anthropologist. Oh. All right. Well, that, that footnote will be corrected. <laughs> well, you've got to correct a lot of things that came up on the screen. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Have a good day, as they say. Right. right. Thank you.